Okay, my name is Bob Bose. I'm on the board of the Public Banking Institute, and it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Roseanne Junker. And um, I'm just going to read off of our website here. Uh, after finishing her doctoral dissertation on state-owned Bank of North Dakota, Roseanne worked as Governor Jerry Brown's Deputy Director of California's Pension Investment Unit and as a legislative economist for U.S. Senator Mark Andrews, Republican, North Dakota. She is now the founding executive director of First Graduate, an organization that helps young people finish high school and become the first in their families to graduate from college. She is the author of The Bank of North Dakota, an experiment in state ownership, 1989, and is featured in the half-hour video, The Bank of North Dakota, on prairiepublic.org. Uh, video links, uh, I, I, I can't give you a URL here, um, audio-wise, but um, her conference presentation will address the questions, how has the BND managed to survive politically, and what difference has it made to the economic well-being of the state? And uh, Roseanne Junker, please. Um, I have my clock here, and uh, Bob has asked me to try to limit my comments to half an hour so we can get back on schedule. What I didn't tell him is it's still on California time, so I have <laughs> three and a half hours. Um, uh, first of all, thank you, Public Banking Institute, for letting me come. Uh, when I got Mark's email about the conference, I thought, how could they do this without me? And so <laughs> I very gently wrote him back an email and said, um, why are you in Philadelphia? <laughs> and, and he very kindly took the hint and said, would you like to come? <laughs> and I said, yes, I would like to come. So uh, it's very exciting for me to be here in the room with all of you. So I just want to thank the, uh, the organization for allowing me to invite myself. <laughs> um, how many people have been to North Dakota? Well, that's pretty cool. You might have. <laughs> And, and for those people who haven't been to North Dakota, how many people have met somebody from North Dakota? And it can't be me and it can't be Ed. <laughs> okay. You do? <laughs> what does your psychologist say about that? <laughs> well, I want to just um, uh, put you in touch with a few famous people from North Dakota. We are not simply a state of farmers, but um, we have had famous TV personalities, famous um, um, politicians, we have had famous uh, news commentators, movie stars, musicians, um, and I'm going to see if you can guess who they are. Uh, okay, who's, this is the hardest one. I'm going to give you the hardest one first so that you end up on a very successful note. Who is the CBS, or CBS, yeah, the CBS news commentator who was the first person to report the fall of Paris in World War II? From North Dakota. He was an Edward R. Merle boy, as they were known. First name Eric? Okay, good. Good, good, good. 50% on that one. Uh, okay, now we also have great sports personalities. Who is the uh, three time winning coach for the Chicago Bulls and three time winning coach for the LA Lakers? Phil Jackson. 100% on Phil. We'll stay in the sports mode. Um, who broke Babe Ruth's single season home run record? Roger Maris. Very good. I should take your names here. <laughs> Go on to music. <laughs> we'll go on to music. Um, the day the music died, the plane crash with um, Buddy Holly, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, the Big Bopper. Who stood in in Moorhead, Minnesota? Who stood in for them when they obviously failed to appear? Oh, this is the hardest one. Uh, he wrote Rubber Ball. He wrote um, Take Good Care of My Baby. Okay, fine, Ed. Bobby V. Bobby v. And do you know who played piano for Bobby V when he was first starting out? 
Bob Dylan. So this is, <laughs> this is a very Midwest oriented presentation. Uh, How about this one? The third, no, the third sexiest television star of all time. <laughs> no, this is behind Diana Rigg and George Clooney, who tied for first. Policewoman, Angie, Angie Dickinson. Okay, good. The two other answers, well, I won't read you the quotes, the two other answers are Lawrence Welk and Sitting Bull. But, um, We'll just leave them for another time. Uh, I grew up on a farm in North Dakota. Um, my parents are farmers, my grandparents are farmers, and before them, their grandparents in Norway were farmers. So I come at the Bank of North Dakota, and I come at the issues that began the Bank of North Dakota from a very personal standpoint. Um, I, uh, my, my grandparents, my great-grandparents lost their farm in the Depression. Um, my sister and her husband had to stop farming because they couldn't borrow any money. So you know, in the 80s, and so it's very much part of who I am. Um, and so when it came time for me to start looking for doctoral dissertation subjects, it absolutely came to me, how has the Bank of North Dakota managed to survive economic or politically and hasn't made any difference economically? And it was an important question for me because I'm the first in my family to go to college and uh, I got my college loan from the Bank of North Dakota. And so it actually, the bank essentially allowed me to go to college. I went to my local bank and they sent me to the Bank of North Dakota. So uh, the Bank of North Dakota made the first federally guaranteed student loan in uh, 1967 and I took my first one in 1969. And the bank was able to do that because they had been making student loans for 10 years before that. You know, they had made a commitment to the education um, of, of the state. And so uh, I can answer this question and Bob would be very happy and I could be off the stage in five minutes. Uh, Economically, yes, it's made a huge difference. There's probably, I would say, half a billion dollars in um, return investment to the state of North Dakota over its lifetime. If the bank's not quite 100 years old, uh, 300 million of those dollars came in the last 10 to 12 years. There's 100 million uh, up until 1980, so between 1980 and 2000, I just threw in another 100 million. So it could be easily more than half a billion. Um, and, and so it's not only the money that is returned to the general fund, but it's also the programs that have allowed um, the state to develop uh, unique and um, people-oriented programs for the bank, like uh, the response to the Minot flood and the Grand Forks flood before it. Those are 100-year floods. And um, the president of the bank was saying a couple of weeks ago that the governor of North Dakota called him into his office and said, Eric, we have two events, two, I don't know what the word was, exceptional events. We have an exceptional institution like the Bank of North Dakota. We've had this exceptional event in Minot which flooded out the entire community. Now it's up to you to find an exceptional solution to that problem. And the bank did. So economically, there's been no question. The question politically is where I think I'm going to, where I am going to focus today is how it's managed to survive politically. And um, my thinking is we can maybe take some lessons from that, since that's really where we are at the, at the um, ground floor. The, but, but actually the answer, how we survive politically, is a very easy answer too. Because it's such a good idea that once the opponents took control of the bank, they really didn't want to get rid of it, because they realized that the tool that it served to help them implement their programs as well. So. Um, I thought that, that Gar and I did not talk before um, his presentation and my presentation. And in my mind, I was sitting in the back there and I was thinking that he was giving us the sky. You know, he was showing us what could be, he was showing us some of the past, but he was really inspiring us and asking us to think in a very big way, in a very encompassing way, and a way to understand how. Um, we have to all move forward on this issue. It's just not public banking, but it's, it's um, the environment and blah, 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 blah. Um, and I'm actually going to take this really narrow and absolutely right down to the ground uh, as we talk about the first two years of the bank. And so it's a very um, politically oriented conversation that I'd like to have with you today. Um, in the theory that um, 
the Spanish philosopher who said, and I'm going to quote him, um, those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it. And my thinking is, is if we can remember the past, we might be able to replicate it. So that's my theory on this one. Um, North Dakota is a very small state. It's about uh, between 640 and 680,000 people. It's one of the less densely populated states. There's 10 people per square mile. Um, only Montana, Wyoming, and Alaska have less people per square mile. And um, in 1919, when the bank was created, you had 90% or 95% of the people were engaged in farming. Um, and farming in 1919 was horse-driven steam engines. Um, there are some cattle, but it was primarily a um, one crop economy, and that was wheat. And the, um, since statehood, which was in 1888, the entire political spectrum of North Dakota was run by the party bosses, both on the Republican side of the ticket as well as the Democratic side of the ticket. And Alexander Mackenzie, who actually had been born in Ontario and came down to North Dakota when he was 16 years old, ran the Republican Party. He was a Republican National Committeeman and he essentially was in the employment of the railroads, the banks, and the grain elevators. And it was those three industries that really ran the state. And those industries did not exist in North Dakota. They existed in Minnesota. And so for 30 years between the statehood in 1889 and the formation of the bank in 1919, the, the politics of the state was run from Minneapolis and the economy of the state was run from Minneapolis. And there were many attempts, there were many political attempts to try to allow um, the farmers to take greater control of their economic destiny, if you will. The uh, Farmers Alliance um, outlawed every evil practice. The um, elevator said, oh, you're outlawing all these evil practices, we're going to leave the state. The Attorney General said, don't worry, I won't enforce the laws, and he did it. So that was that. Then. Uh, in the 18, early 1890s, the populist movement started, came along, and really tried to reform things on behalf of the farmers. But uh, North Dakota, the legislature meets every two years for six to eight weeks. And they had to elect a congressman. It took them in 18, 1892, it took them 61 ballots to elect a congressman. So by the time they had elected the congressman, there was no time to um, regi do any legislation. So that was the end of the populist, uh, or the end of yes, the end of the populist um, movement in North Dakota. The next came the progressives a little while later, but the progressives were a middle class movement and really concerned with issues that um, dealt more with oh, what urban middle class people were concerned with. They didn't um, address any of the issues, uh, economic issues relating to farmers. The um, farmers union and the cooperative union. Um, started organizing in the early 19 teens, but they didn't have any money on which to operate on, and so they were very much stymied. Um, which, actually, there's, I have 10 tenants in this, in this presentation. Um, so I, I guess really what that says to me is that there was a need for change. There's no question that there was a need for change that 95% um, of the population was engaged in farming, 95% of the population was being ripped off by big business, and um, even the banks agreed. U.S. control of the currency said that two-thirds of the nationally chartered banks were charging you serious interest rates. So there is, and, and the North Dakota Bankers Association agreed with them, and yet the, there is no political will um, to change. There is no attempt to regulate private banking, and the industry had no attempt had made no attempt to um, regulate it itself. So the Nonpartisan League started the bank, um, started organizing the farmers. The Nonpartisan League came out of the socialist movement. Uh, the socialists were fighting among themselves, to trying to decide whether education should be the priority or political action should be the priority. Um, one group felt that um, without education there could be no political action. One group said, oh, you know, um, Dan the torpedoes, uh, whatever, I'll, I'll forget, I can't remember that one. Anyway, the other one said political action. Well, the political action uh, group um, succeeded from the Socialist Party and went on to organize the most successful uh, political organization the state has ever seen. And by 1919, 
the nonpartisan league had taken control of the governor's office, the Supreme Court, the House of Representatives, and the Senate, and all of the other state offices. And so with that kind of support, um, they, in two months, created the state-owned Bank of North Dakota. They created an industrial commission to run the bank. They um, gave the state bonding authority to sell bonds to finance the bank and to sell bonds to um, develop a real estate mortgage or to provide real estate mortgages for the state. Um, there was, there's a real sense that the reason the Nonpartisan League was successful is because it had separated itself from the party and it had separated itself from dogma. It wasn't about the left or the right, it was about we have a real problem here and we need a practical solution, hence the word nonpartisan. They ran their candidates on the Democratic side of the ticket. They ran their candidates on the Republican side of the ticket. Um, and they hired um, the first president of the North Dakota Bankers Association to run the bank. You know, so they're very clear that they wanted an institution that um, was going to be able to survive in the long run. And, and he, the, the president of the bank, um, made a commitment to work with the state bankers. And so one of the things he did after the bank was first organized was sit down with an advisory committee of state bankers and say, uh, you know, try to lessen the antagonism of the um, political debates in the, uh, in the legislature and say, now we're here, how can we help you, how can you help us? And he agreed to a couple of things. He agreed to no branches of the state-owned bank and he also agreed that the current deposits uh, that were in other banks, let's see, how do I say this? Um, the Bank of North Dakota to be financed needed the state's deposits to as working capital. If they were to get that working capital, that working capital had been now in the five or 600 banks all the way around the state. If the Bank of North Dakota was to remove that working capital from those banks, those banks would fail. So they agreed to leave the state's deposits among the other private banks and to sell, real, to sell bonds to capitalize themselves. So, and, and they were selling, they needed to sell in today's dollars $160 million worth of bonds, both to capitalize the bank as well as to um, develop the lending policies. Um, the bank's mission uh, then is the same mission as it is now. Uh, to promote agriculture, commerce, and industry, and to serve the people of the state. And it's a very broad mission, and it gives um, a tremendous flexibility to policymakers. Um, unfortunately, I mean, one of the reasons that the bank agreed to work with the state bankers is it needed to sell those bonds to somebody. And you need to sell bonds to the people who have the money, and who has the money but the bankers. Um, so. Um, it was quite clear that um, the, the, the president, Capito, was attempting to um, assuage concerns, political concerns that the state had. But it was also quite clear that the local bankers were not willing to help them buy the bonds. And the um, kind of the fourth lesson is you can't have a bank without money. And so hence um, the opponents of the bank understood that if they could stop the sale of these bonds, they could stop a state-owned bank. And so the next two years, you saw, to me, I think, one of the most exciting um, political uh, uh, Say it again? Yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> you, you saw, you saw a, 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 you saw stuff shoved into these two years that you just can't imagine. Um, I guess you can't start a bank without money, and private. the other flip side of that is private capital is not going to give up easy. So a new political party was formed called the Independent Voters Association. Uh, you also have that sense of independent voters in the same way that you have the sense of nonpartisan, so to see, appeal to the independent farmers. Um, and the Independent Voters Association was to create a kind of mistrust among um, both the farmers in the state as well as the financiers outside of the state that this chaos and confusion in North Dakota 
was such that any investment in state-owned bonds, even though they were guaranteed by the state, any investment in those bonds would be an absolute waste of money. Um, and so they did. The Independent Voters Association, which as you can imagine was financed by Minneapolis, uh, by the banks and by the railroads and by the grain elevators. Um, in fact, the, the, the uh, attorney uh, who was representing the IVA was also the attorney for Great Northern Railroad. So that it, uh, they, um, they had a referendum. They brought forth a referendum uh, which forced the state voters to um, decide whether in fact they wanted the industrial, the Bank of North Dakota and the, and the state voters voted seven times yes, we want the Bank of North Dakota. They had uh, an initiated measure which said we need to have an audit of the Bank of North Dakota and uh, public subdivisions can withdraw their funds. Both of those passed, so the assets of the Bank of North Dakota were cut in half. Um, and the audit, the audit actually found no problems with the bank, um, but it still created uh, that sense of confusion and chaos. Um, what I love is one of the um, one of the press in North Dakota, which did not support the NPL and did not support the public banking um, effort, called it the the NPL, the mouthing of long-haired radicals. And I thought, isn't that funny? You know how history repeats itself: the mouthing of long-haired radicals. Um, there was also a recall election, so uh, and the people eventually did agree to um, recall the nonpartisan league governor, attorney general, and commissioner of agriculture. There was um, also defections within the nonpartisan league itself, and I think to me, in some ways, the most amazing thing is there were two Supreme Court challenges to the state-owned bank uh, came through, you know, came up through the state to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court held, in fact, in fact, that you could, if the people of the state wanted to have a state-owned bank, they could. And they had voted seven times to have a state-owned bank. Um, but all of this meant that the bonds didn't sell. You know, all, they, they, there would be an attempt to sell the bonds. There would be an, uh, uh, yes, we're gonna, we've got a $3 million sale in 1919. The bankers from the railroads would come and say, or the, the lobbyists from the railroads would come and say, you can't buy these bonds. We've got, we're in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. You don't know if they're going to be any good or not. And so the buyers would refuse to sell, would refuse to buy them. So anyway, long story short, uh, the bank did go on the defensive. And this is also um, one of the things that Gar was talking about. I mean, they went to the people to sell the bonds. And they, they made um, a direct appeal to the, quote, the great class of investors those who work and save and want to put their savings in enterprises that will better the condition of the people. So people who bought the bonds included um, the Detroit mayor, the American Federation of Labor, the Public Ownership League, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers in Cleveland, uh, the editor of the nation, uh, the suffragette Alice Blackwell, Clarence Darrow, 23 um, people from 23 different states bought bonds in the Bank of North Dakota to support the, um, to, to support the system. Um, at the end of 1921, um, October 1921, a company out of Toledo, Ohio, uh, Spitzer Borick, finally decided to buy $12 million of the bonds. And uh, they decided to buy those bonds because of the success of the small sale. And with $12 million, the Bank of North Dakota could then go on to finance real estate uh, loans, to finance the state-owned mill of an elevator, um, to help finance the hail insurance, to help finance the Home Building Association. Um, but of course, by then it was too late for the nonpartisan league uh, because the day after these bonds sold, the Independent Voters Association took control of the governor's office, the attorney general's office, and the Commissioner of Agriculture. So in a 24-hour period, you had the sale of the, of the bonds, which meant that the industrial program would go forward and the Bank of North Dakota would go forward. And then you turned over the control of that bank and the industrial program to people who, didn't, who were philosophically opposed to it and who had spent the last few years trying to defeat it. And, and the irony is, and, and this is sort of what I love about this story, the irony is, is once those guys got control of the bank, 
they said, hmm. I mean, there was a move to depoliticize it, and they said, wait a second here. <laughs> we, we can see a vision for this bank after all, and we can see where it could be helpful, and we're going to run it correctly. And, and, and that's essentially the story, you know, over the last 70 years, is, is, is that it really hasn't mattered as much who has been in control politically in North Dakota, um, whether it's those people, uh, Democrats or Republicans. Uh, as far as the bank goes, um, there has been a very clear way that the bank has been allowed to serve the people of the state over the last, you know, 70 or 80 years. And um, the sense that service is critical, the sense that making a profit is not the first priority of the bank, it can't afford to lose money, but it, it, it doesn't have to make as much money as long as it provides a service, and that's what it's done. Um, it has needed to protect its assets. It has, has to run. It is a bank, after all, and it has to run like a bank. Um, it, it had, I think, one of the saddest chapters, the number of loans it had to foreclose on in the uh, 1930s. You know, it had to foreclose on probably $40 million worth of farm loans. It lost $18.8 million uh, in farm loans, but what the bank did, and, and again, this is one of those examples of what a state-owned bank can do, it sold those farms back to the original owners. I should say this, it gave the original owners the opportunity to buy their farms back at cost, you know, what the bank had in it. And I thought, I thought to myself with the meltdown of the whole mortgage industry, what if, what if the people had been given the opportunity to buy their homes back? you know, at what the bank had in it, you know. Um, and so it's, it's that kind of unique and radical thinking that the bank allows, that having a state owned bank allows policymakers to do. Um, I'm pretty much up. Uh, the biggest question that I have, just as a person, is, and I think it's the biggest challenge, as you look to develop public banking, uh, the state of North Dakota has given um, the bank great leeway, but it is also still run by a political bo body. It's still run by an industrial commissioner, the governor, the attorney general, and the commissioner of agriculture. And in California, at least, probably the only people who are less respected than the bankers are the politicians. And so how, how do we um, manage that issue? You know, how do we manage, again, it gets back to the control of capital, and, and do we really, well, I don't know the answer, so maybe you do. Anyway, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.